Hi everyone, um, welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Heather Steele, I'm the Networking and Development Manager for YLP Scotland and we're joined by Dr Ben Todd from Arcola Energy who's going to be talking about hydrogen fuel cell technology, its benefits, challenges and about Scotland's first hydrogen train hopefully coming later this year. So the format of tonight, ben, Ben's going to present for about half an hour and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for a question and answer session. So you can type your questions into the, the question box or the chat box, which should be on the right hand side of your screen in the little grey box. And if you can't see um, any options, then if you click the arrow at the top, that should expand and you should be able to type things in. So before we begin, um, I just want to remind you about some of the events that we've got coming up. Um, on the last Friday of every month, we have our monthly virtual lunch, catch, lunch chat uh, at one o'clock. So you can drop by for, for 10 minutes, half an hour or whatever, have a break, um, have a chat with other YRP members um, in Scotland. And this year we also have the second year of our annual rail track event on the 28th of August. So this year we're doing 30 kilometres from Old Kilpatrick to Helensra along the John Muir Way to raise money for the railway children. It was a great event last year. We raised over three and a half thousand pounds and uh, this year we're hoping to make it even bigger and better I think we were limited to 16 people because of COVID and this year we're looking at 50. So if you're interested, if you want to know more, it's a great opportunity to, to get out, to raise money for charity, meet new people and enjoy some great scenery. Um, you can obviously find out more about YRP Scotland events and any other YRP events on the YRP website. Okay, that's, um, that's me finished. I'll hand over to you, Ben, to talk about the hydrogen train project. Thank you. Grand. Uh, evening, folks. Uh, hopefully you can see me all right. I'm uh, hiding in the garage from the kids, so hopefully we'll get some peace and quiet for the next hour or so. Um, so, yeah, really nice to be talking to you all. Um, I hope I can live up to the, uh, the the PR that's gone with this event. I've been uh, heavily promoted, so uh, we'll see see how we get on. Um, so, yeah, the, the model is I'm going to talk at you for about half an hour. Um, I think you can't interrupt me, so unfortunately you just have to think about the things you want to ask me about or heckle me about later. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have half an hour of, of chat. Um, and yeah, happy to cover anything and everything. Um, so what I've got here, I've got a pile of slides here, some stuff about Arcola, some about the specific Scottish Hydrogen Train project, some stuff about the kind of way we think about the market and way, where things are going. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no script, so we'll just see see what see what I, what I think of to tell you about. Uh, and then uh, yeah, anything I don't cover, feel free to ask me about afterwards. Um, so I'll kind of carry on that. I'll assume that one of the organizer guys will let me know if at some point you can't see me or hear me. Um, but hopefully you can all see see some slides now. I uh, figured out who I am. Um, so yeah, we'll kick off with a, a little bit about Arcola. Um, so what we call ourselves is a, a leading UK specialist in hydrogen fuel cell integration. And the focus really is on heavy duty vehicles. It's a bit of a stock stock image here. Um, on the on the far left, kind of hiding at the back there, are the passenger cars. So we leave that to the likes of Toyota and Hyundai. Um, vans is something that we kind of skitter around on and off, on and off, on and off. Um, and we, we're not doing vans at the moment. That may, may or may not change. But the real focus at the moment is on these heavy vehicles. Um, so truck on the side here. There isn't a train, but clearly we're doing trains as well. So trucks, buses, trains. And to a certain extent, ships. Uh, but the real focus at the minute is truck, bus, train. So that's that's most of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and the key, really, for those areas is that the kit you put in is more or less the same. Um, so the approach fits well. The type of fuel cell we use, uh, the approach to integration, the approximate scale, uh, it all kind of fits within a, a kind of nice nice package where you can put a lot a lot of the similar stuff in each each of those platforms. And if you like, I don't know where all of you are in your careers. Uh, the bit that I find really interesting um, is uh, is the compliance piece. How, how do you make these things work in a way that in each of those different industries with different requirements, different constraints, different regulatory regimes, different history of accidents and, and emergencies and so on that have turned into shaping the expectation? How, how do you make it fit into all of them? And how can we kind of learn from and take the best of all those different areas and apply it to everything we do to make everything kind of better, safer, stronger, and so on. Um, so that's what we do in fuel cells and hydrogen. Those of you who've paid much attention to it, um, yeah, the, the kind of joke is they've been 10 years from commercialization for about 100 years. Um, so the, the technology has been around for a long time. 
we're starting to see very, very strong interest at the moment. This isn't the first time, though. It, uh, hydrogen and fuel cells really follows a bit of a hype cycle, a kind of repeated hype cycle uh, of being kind of overhyped. Uh, people love to say it's the most abundant element in the universe and so on and so forth. Um, typically, if somebody starts with that, I usually just ignore it um, because it's not really about whether it's abundant. It's not really about whether it's the simplest element. It's not about this, that and the other. It's about can you actually make it useful? And so over, over the years, it's, hydrogen and fuel cells have been applied to things where they didn't make sense or they've been applied at a time when the technology wa wasn't ready yet. Or, in fact, at a time when a lot of the other supporting technologies that you need weren't ready yet. So I, I say that now we're coming out of this kind of very long gestation period. The world is sort of ready. We've understood the we give enough importance to the things that fuel cells can really help us with. And the broader technology has got good enough so that we can actually make stuff do do what we want. So we've been around for about 10, 15 years. I've been in the field for the best part of 20. And so what we've evolved into is this kind of strange company that does market creation, product development, manufacture and aftermarket. So again, then you to the kind of know the, the structure of industries. That's not typically how it works. You know, the, each of those different areas is typically covered by yeah, multiple companies. Uh, but in fuel cells and hydrogen, trying to bring it all together so you actually create a product that makes sense, that meets the customer requirements, that you can be an engineer to a standard that you're happy with, and that you can manufacture in a way that you want and then provide the aftermarket support through the whole lifetime um, is non-trivial. There aren't people you can just call up and say, hey, can you look after my fuel cell vehicle? Um, so we do the whole lot. Uh, works nicely for us at the moment. And we'll, we'll obviously we'll, we'll see how the market evolves. So the core focus really is that systems integration and then it, tier one is a kind of automotive parlance. Uh, I assume it's somewhat similar in rail. So the, the people that supply into the, the, the OEM, the, the, the main the vehicle owner. Um, and so that's typically where you sit. Although, again, because of the way this market's evolving, we actually find ourselves acting as a kind of OEM. So sort of virtual OEM or pseudo OEM, as in the customer will buy the vehicle from us and actually will buy the chassis. Or the ret or the, the 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 old old rolling stock, um, and we'll do the integration so that we hold the warranty, the certifications, all that responsibility for making sure it's right can potentially sit with us. Uh, which again is, I suppose, part of the nature of this industry. It's, a, it's an early stage industry, so a small company. There's about seventy of us um, can effectively be the vehicle manufacturer. It's a it's a it's a strange world we live in. Um, so where we're up to at the moment. So we started out down in London. Um, got, still, we've still got headquarters in London. We've got a production uh, prototyping facility in London out in Enfield. Um, two, the focus of our work though really is in Scotland already. Um, so Bowness uh, at the uh, Bowness and Keneal Railway, where we've got a team on the ground doing the conversion for the Scottish train project and actually uh, opening, I think there's, uh, there's guys starting next week, uh, in Dundee, uh, which will be our main application to engineering system and vehicle assembly and in fact aftermarket facility um, so that big big Dundee push is uh, is where we're going um, in terms of where, where how have we got to here uh, so the company started formally in about 2010 we'd actually done some stuff a few years before that but really kind of kicking off in in the early uh, 2012 let's say um, small vehicles typically university projects a lot of and I, I have a PhD so you know, that re that university link, the research link, at that point was really important, building capability and understanding and actually helping stuff out of the lab into, into reality. Um, relatively early on, I suppose, we, we went into buses. We did the first fuel cell double deck bus uh, in 2014. And actually, there's a really important learning that came out of that. One of the partners we were working with on that just didn't have the same level of, I suppose, obsession, let's say, with quality, compliance, safety, um, and wanted to kind of cut some corners. And so we actually killed the project before we brought it to market. Um, and it, in, in some sense, that was a really important turning stone for us as a company to say, no, that we're, we're not gonna be the guys that just slam it together and have a look, hope it's all right and fix it later. Uh, we're gonna go with this quality compliance piece uh, and re really push on that. Um, and so far, so good. You know, The company was created mainly out of my frustration that the market wasn't moving quick enough. Somebody needs to put this stuff together and do it properly. And, uh, and it's, it's grown. So we sort of focus on where we are now, um, so 2020, 21. Um, so it's the, the refuse collection vehicles, it's the train, it's the bus. We did a, a 20 ton off-road hydraulic machine um, two years ago now, I guess it is. Uh, we've done some buses before. So it's, you can see the drift into this, this heavier stuff. Um, 
Scottish Terrain Project is a really nice one. So let's touch on this a little bit. Um, we really like this project because it's, yes, of course, we have to make a train run on hydrogen fuel cells, um, but actually that's not really what it's about. The, the project really is about understanding the, that requirement. Yeah, well, what do we need to do to put hydrogen trains on the rails? Um, thinking about the manufacturer, thinking about the integration, about the operation, the interface with that whole rail system. Um, and actually also, what about the supply chain? Yeah, this is a new new market, new industry. How do we set up the supply chain? Who needs to learn what? There's a big skills piece. Um, and there's a really nice opportunity for, for developing local supply chain. But wherever we are, we want to develop local supply chain. Uh, and given how much of us are going to, going to be and in, increasingly are in Scotland, that, that means Scottish supply chain. Um, so there it is on in, in words, um, the Hydrogen Trade Project. So it's Scottish Enterprise, Transport Scotland and the Hydrogen Accelerator. So the fact that we've almost got kind of three three customers, um, Scottish Enterprise is about developing skills, jobs, green green economy. You know, that comes before trains. It's not a Roscoe that we're working to. It's not even you know um, the, the, the rail component of Transport Scotland. It's, it's a wide family of Transport Scotland people we're working to. And the Hydrogen Accelerator, which is a, a, a kind of within the University of St Andrews, has been set up to bring together industry, academia, public sector and try and just make stuff happen. So this is a project about making things happen. Um, to do this, then we've brought in, as our caller, we've brought in our A-Drive platform. So going back to that point about putting the similar stuff into bus, truck and train. So how do you go fast? How do you get product to market that's really good really quickly? It was, you know, here's one I prepared earlier. So bringing in as much of that, uh, but then obviously having to learn rail engineering. I'm certainly not a rail person by background. A couple of the team already had some rail background but we've grown a really strong rail team really quickly and collaborated. And I think this is going to be, yeah, let's say, it always was the basis of getting stuff done is collaboration, uh, but particularly where you've got a, a new a new field emerging and the complexity, the interactions between the supply chain of the vehicle and of the fuel in hydrogen and fuel cells, collaboration is key. So we've got really nice collaboration with Arup, uh, with uh, Abbott Risk Consulting um, on the, if you like the engineering, the design, the safety case, uh, and then Aegis doing the kind of verification and certification. So pulling that in as a kind of collaboration to get stuff done, and then working with the various Scottish agencies to really do a lot of supply chain development, um, which is really nice. You know, so people, if you like, as a as a, a, an environmentally leaning type person, um, working with oil and gas uh, industry people and saying, well, come and come and join the green side. Uh, it's actually been a really, really nice thing to do and actually a great way to tap up lots of great skills. So not just rail skills, but but other industry. Um, so there's there's the objectives so that that points that. Yeah, nowhere on there does it say drive a train. Um, and this is again, it goes back to that, the stage at which the industry is. You know, so fuel, fuel cells in rail, you know, some demonstrations have been done. Yeah. You know, um, you, you've got the Eilinz, which is a you know a proper production train uh, in Germany running on hydrogen fuel cells, but it's that's an outlier. Most of most of the world's rail industry is, is looking to to move, or well, certainly to a large extent, based on the number of calls we're getting, uh, take a certain pretty strong interest in this area. Um, so maybe drop into a little bit of technology now. So you know what what's it made up of. So at the heart, I guess there's uh, it's got a lot of hearts. Um, so let, let's start with the, the bit that we, we have to talk about hydrogen train. I guess you think about the hydrogen, the hydrogen storage. So that's the tanks. So you can see them in there. Um, and they are, uh, so it's carbon fiber wrapped, either aluminium or polymer liner, so similar to the kind of things you put in CNG, uh, uh, CNG vehicles. Uh, and that's your energy storage. So if you want a long range, you add more tanks. Uh, the fuel cell then, is, if people think of it as, as the engine, um, and that's the bit that converts the hydrogen using oxygen from the air into electricity. Um, and we think of this as the, this is doing your average power. So you size the fuel cell to meet the average requirement, and it should rumble along relatively steady state, kind of oscillating up and down, but not, not fast. It's not, it's not load following. And so the other bit that, and this is the bit where when people get into that, oh, we know hydrogen or fuel cells, which one's good, which one's bad. Uh, we work with both. So we use a high power battery, so not an energy battery, 
just the kind of thing that you plug in overnight and then run down all, all day. Uh, we're using a power battery, which looks a bit more, uh, acts more like a supercapacitor. So I say that we hammer it. You'll, you'll see some of the juicy cycles in a minute. Uh, and this is the bit that load follows. And so in, in almost all hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, even installations, you'll find batteries. So they're sister technologies, I think of. They're, they're both electrochemical. One has the energy stored inside, one has the energy stored outside. Um, and so we, we pair them together and getting the right battery chemistry, the right sizing, the right control strategy, that's the core bit of I suppose, what we spent the last, well, in my case, 20 years figuring out how to do. Um, there's then obviously some key power electronics to make that stuff work. And when I was talking about when is the right time for fuel cells and hydrogen, a big part of that is actually around the power electronics. So if we look at passenger car, so Toyota are doing the Mirai, which is their fuel cell vehicle, actually it owes an awful lot to the Prius, which is a, a you know, petrol hybrid, because for the Prius, they developed all of the control, the safety, the motors, the, the, all, all of those ancillary components were electrified to make the battery hybrid vehicle work, which then paves the way for the fuel cell hybrid. Uh, and so again, the reason that we can bring these products to market is because batteries have got really quite good power electronics, battery electric vehicles have got really quite good. So we add the fuel cell and we get that extra extra bit of magic if you do it right in the right place. So what's it look like on a train? Um, so this is the, the lovely old 314. Uh, you have to fit around the sandbox. Um, so you know, you've got to fit around what's there already. But essentially on these trains, they haven't got a lot of air conditioning. It's a relatively simple platform. Uh, and so Right from the start on this project, we said we really, really want to get everything under slung, everything under the train. We're not putting hydrogen in the in the, the carriages because we don't want to be taking out passenger space. It simplifies the safety and compliance if you haven't got hydrogen in there. And we also don't want loads of it. We don't want it to look like a science lab. So this is a really sharp, it's a fairly ludicrous time scale. Nine months to do a train, retractioning the whole lot. Yeah, who does that? Um, but we still don't want it to look like a science lab. So pushing ourselves really quite hard to get all the kit underneath. Uh, and it also means it's quite easy to see. So there's your fuel cell. Uh, there's a load of cooling. Behind it's a load of uh, uh, air cylinders and the, the, the basic stuff that needs to be on the train. And there's your hydrogen storage. Uh, one of the other carriages is, is the battery and the compressor. So there's the bits. So let's just drop into then what's the, what's the journey towards making, well, hopefully, a very good hydrogen fuel cell train. And the first part we start with and everything, and then going back to assuming you're relatively young and not that far out of, out of training university, um, you know, how much did you get taught about systems engineering? I know I did an engineering degree and I didn't. Um, uh, so that systems engineering piece of really deeply understanding the requirements, decomposing the requirements, then, then slowly but surely building up each element of the system in such a way that you can then carry across those requirements both physical so performance requirements and compliance and build back up the other side to understand have actually, am I meeting my requirements? Am I meeting my standards? Is this a good product? Um, so we're pretty, pretty obsessive with this. So this is some in-house software that we've developed over the years, which will model buses, trucks, trains. So you feed it a duty cycle, so speed and elevation in the simplest sense. Uh, you then add to that obviously the parameters of the vehicle. Um, so, you know, what's the rolling resistance? What's the frontal area? Um, various parameters for the vehicle. And then you can build from that what's the, the uh, if you then assume a fuel cell system, battery system, and hydrogen storage, you can start to model out what, what kind of performance you get. So you're capturing the requirements. And the, the, the key bit with this really is getting the right balance of physics and parameterizing uh, existing product. So we're not saying what we really need is a 52.453 kilowatt fuel cell. We're saying, okay, if you use one of these fuel cells that we can get off the shelf and these batteries we can get off the shelf and these hydrogen tanks we can get off the shelf, here's a product that we can create. So it's, it's always focused on that accelerating the route to market. Um, so here's a bit of fun that kind of comes out of this modeling. Um, and this is early stage, but actually really probably quite important is thinking about well, what, what's the capability so before you dive into all that detailed engineering, here's a class 158, two car set. And we reckon that the hydrogen consumption is about 25 kilograms per 100 kilometers. Here's the 170, three car set, about 28 kilograms per 100 kilometers. 
So don't take these as gospel, but take them as, as indicative based on the data we've managed to accumulate through our partners and various people. Um, what you can see there is you get three cars for not much more hydrogen, you get two cars. And it's pretty obvious that you've got more space underneath the three car set than you've got underneath the two car set. So what that leads you towards, and this is early stage, but this is think of this as, as thinking rather than fact. Um, is that actually if you go for a longer train, if you were to look at a six car set, you might be looking at one uh, 1500 kilometer range. So potentially you can get up to diesel equivalent range. And that's why you would bother going, well, we've got batteries, they work quite well. Let's get on and do batteries, right? But we've got limited range. So this is where the hydrogen piece becomes interesting. And this again is always focusing on what can you undersling, not putting anything in the carriages. Now you may decide for various, any number of reasons that you just actually, do you know what, we are gonna put some stuff in the carriages, um, but actually let's, let's focus on trying to not impinge passenger space, at least in, in, in the first pass. Um, so this is back to the, the, the hydrogen battery piece. So we see them as complementary. Batteries are brilliant, I love them. Yeah? Use batteries where they make sense. Um, so I think I've probably said it enough. I won't, I won't go through this again, but just think about that there are, there's a bunch of reasons why you might think about looking at batteries or fuel cells for different applications. And it's horses for courses. In a similar way, you could think petrol versus diesel. Yeah, we have both uh, and you use diesel typically for heavy duty cycle, longer range, and you use petrol typically for Putland around town. Um, and that, that's, you, you, you can, in some sense, your, your, your fuel cell battery uh, mix. So a big part of this project, the, the Scottish train project was looking at rolling stock options. So, so the future, what's the route to market? So in the early stages, people say, well, this is new technology, it's kind of expensive, so let's put it on a new train. And there's, there's your first, first position. Um, and then typically people go, oh, we want to get a project done quickly, so could you do some repowering? And they give you a 40-year-old train, the last, last, the last ever. Um, and what we found through this process and of doing more, more analysis, more understanding, is actually the repowering. If you want to decarbonize quickly, and potentially if you want to offer a stopgap whilst you're trying to roll out you know, the, the massive infrastructure job of electrifying rails, or electrifying lines, um, actually by repowering, you can decarbonize your fleets much more quickly. Um, and so actually the repowering option has actually become much of much greater interest really than we thought it would uh, when, when we first sort of came into rail a couple of years ago. Um, so taking that on board, you know, where, where, where do you start? Where, where do you go next? Um, so those of you that follow policy might have, might have paid some attention to this. So this is, uh, there's some work that's been done across across the UK, and this is obviously the focusing on the Scottish Scottish element. Um, these these nice colours, if you can see them well enough, we've got the red lines that are already electrified, obviously across the central belt. Um, we've got some areas that we want some alternative traction, permanent solution. So these 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 are lines that aren't heavily used. Nobody really thinks there's going to be a business case for electrifying those lines. So we're going to have to find a way of making those lines run. Um, so sort of for the for the long time slash forever using something other than electrified lines so that's in green and the yellow is a kind of transition these are the lines that we're saying well it's going to take us a while to electrify that uh, so we need to think about something transitional and again that's potentially where that retrofit piece becomes really interesting um, so whether you end up with batteries or fuel cells on the green lines to be seen see where the market goes what 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 do, what do you do develop both there will be market for both let's see where they end up uh, and the transition, arguably the transition will, there will be an awful lot more transition, I think, than, than people have recognised yet, just because of the time it takes to do electrification. Um, and so I won't go into this, but yeah, the, the similar logic that we're applying up in Scotland obviously applies elsewhere in the, in, in the UK uh, and indeed internationally. Um, so to pull back out to one of those other objectives of the Scottish Train Project, which is supply chain. So we are part of that supply chain as our coal energy. So growing quickly in Scotland. Um, so we do the powertrain. The interesting bit about doing the powertrain is that you kind of sit in the middle of everything and you can then think about where are we going to get our kit from? Um, so your, your general stuff, steel fabrication, piping, plumbing, and so on, and your specialist. And so we've done a lot of work within this project looking at who, who can we work with, who can we form the right kind of relationships with in Scotland primarily, 
um, to, to kind of grow that, that local capability, which if you talk to our fleet manager on, on, on road vehicles, he'll tell you that supply chain, that maintenance ability localized is crucial. That's how you get good service. That's how you get good availability. That's how you make the thing successful. Um, so this is, this is kind of one of the big outcomes from that project. You know, what, what is that long-term route? Yeah, so we move from a demonstration now into some technology trials. At some point, we need to put passengers on these things and do some proper trials into a first fleet. Really important bit I think I've touched on is that alignment with electrification. Yeah, we don't want to be competing with electrification. We want to be complementing. Um, and yeah, how do you build the supply chain? So I take a couple of minutes just to flick through, and I'll, I'll go probably quicker now. Um, just the kind of market approach we've taken in heavy duty vehicles because it, it obviously relates back into into what we're doing in train so probably the first one to think about is 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 a fuel cell vehicle a battery electric vehicle with a fuel cell range extender kind of stuck on top uh, and so the numbers we would say is that's not what you do so you take a low range battery vehicle you add a fuel cell you can increase the range but actually you've got quite a weight penalty because you've probably got the wrong batteries and too many of them um, if you do a fuel cell vehicle, it has absolutely got a battery in, but it's a different battery. And then you're you're getting similar kind of payload that you would originally have in a diesel and the long range and zero emissions. And so that's that's the way we look at it. Um, and it comes back to these without going into these. You can do the numbers to say, well, where does it really make sense to do a battery? And where does it really make sense to do a fuel cell? If it's a smaller shorter duty cycle, the battery will make sense. Do battery, assuming you can charge. Longer duty cycle, you're probably going to go hydrogen. Uh, so there it is in kind of graphical form. Um, piece on infrastructure, this applies less on trains because trains tend to come in fairly big sets relative to buses. Um, but just that, that understanding of the infrastructure. So, and in fact, in rail, we think of electrifying the line as if you like the heart, the, the, the biggest. Now, that's your really big infrastructure. Plugging in a battery train. Is probably your small infrastructure, and that's relatively straightforward for a small number of trains or a small a small duty cycle. And hydrogen probably sits in between battery electric and full electrification of the of the line. And um, doing a quick hydrogen train demo is quite tricky or expensive because hydrogen doesn't work nicely at small volume. Um, so in buses, we say ten hydrogen buses. Poor economics, pretty, pretty bit of a pain to do. Hundred buses, much more straightforward because you're into proper industrial supply of hydrogen, and it can get really cost effective. Uh, so I think in trains, we'll probably move almost immediately to the scale that we've kind of worked really hard to get to in other vehicles. So again, I think it's another reason why we will see quite a lot more interest in hydrogen in trains, not just for the benefit of rail, but actually as a way to get decent sized hydrogen infrastructure in place to meet the cost targets that we need to, just to make hydrogen fuel cells work in general. Uh, so yeah, you, you may find industry becomes very popular uh, and a focus of a lot of intention from people that otherwise weren't, weren't really rail people. Um, so yeah, probably I've said this enough, but this is absolutely what you need to be getting right. Um, so the old field line, definitely what I did get from my engineering education was build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. That is an engineer's mentality and it ain't true. Um, you make a better vehicle, people don't necessarily buy it. You need this full customer proposition. And this is where it gets interesting, this is where it gets challenging. Um, and if you were to wrap around, what I find really interesting is when the customer goes, hang on, what isn't included in here is the environmental offer. So if you can do good vehicles, good fuel, good fleet support, a good financial model, and a proper environmentally sound offer, that's your customer proposition. Then we can really start to move. The tricky bit is people typically at the moment are really struggling to value the environmental piece. We all know we need it. Like most of us want it, but who wants to pay for it? Um, skip over that's the, the, the various vehicle classes we're doing. And uh, stop there, pretty much bang on time, I think. So uh, yeah, over, over to you guys for some questions. Thank you, Ben. That was that was really interesting. Um, I must uh, admit, before we go into the Q&A, I think I should probably tell you that I'm based at the University of Birmingham and you may have heard of the 
Hydroflex project. Um, so I, I've not worked on it personally, but I know a little bit about, about the hydrogen um, train development that, that we've been doing. Um, so just just to, to give you that, that context, if I start asking some, uh, some difficult questions. Um, but we do have a couple that have come up in the chat. So um, we can we can dive straight in. If anybody else has any questions, please do um, use use the chat. Um, or the, sorry, the question tab um, and put them in there. So the first question we've had in is from Liz Lockwood, who says that the the current fire performance standards um, don't cover this technology, um, and you know people think there's a lot of risks with with hydrogen you know, crashes overheating. So how do you account for that and protect the fuel cells and the batteries? Um, good question. Um, so, what's this? So, what's the approach? So, within the kind of common safety methods approach within rail, um, you can take a sensible risk based approach to what you're doing. And within that approach, your preference is to find a standard because the standard is the kind of captured knowledge of generations hundreds thousands of engineers and operations people thinking about what works so use a standard where you can um, but if there isn't a rail standard then yes you can do nothing until one one emerges but the reality of standards is standards are evolved through people doing things and learning about stuff um, so let's say that's not an option and the other thing you can do is you can look at other areas where you can pull in learning and best practice so a lot in, in this case, a lot of what we do is we pull in from automotive. So a lot of the components we're using have got a kind of automotive pedigree. Um, they're not designed to do the number of millions of miles that trains are, um, but there's a very robust and well understood and structured safety and compliance approach for these, these components and these systems. Um, and a lot of those, you know, when hydrogen first came into vehicles, they went, well, where do we learn about this? Oh, well, let's go to the industrial gas, the oil and gas industry. And so there's a kind of pulling through, a natural kind of pulling through of learning and standards across industries. So that's one of the things that as we move between different sectors is I suppose one of the benefits we bring um, and one of the interesting things we learn. Um, so let's say in terms of the approach, that's what you do. Um, in terms of actually, you know, for example, this, this particular train, how are we going to make it safe? So the key bit, I would say is is that robust systems engineering methodology. So really understanding what your requirements are. We've done a lot of work initially on on buses, going around gathering best practice from around the world and kind of sticking to it. It's why you know we 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 killed our first bus project. We had a lot of arguments in in the bus industry. We're saying, well, no, you simply can't do that unless you're going to plan for there to be teenagers smoking on the back seat of the bus. I don't want, don't want my name on that bus. Um, and so by taking a really quite robust approach to it and saying, we have to plan for the worst um, with a robust engineering methodology and drawing from the rail industry, which obviously got a very good safety culture and something that other industries don't have, rail has a whole system mentality. So in vehicles, you go, well, I need to make my vehicle safe. What about the roads? Oh, that's someone else's job. What about the pedestrians? Oh, that's someone else's job. What about the fuel? Oh, that's somebody else's job. In rail, you don't do that. In rail, you think of the whole piece. So it's actually a really nice environment in which to do that. Um, and so, yeah, in, in practical terms, get the right kit, engineer it right, package it right. Um, and actually, it's not really any more dangerous than anything else, arguably safer. Um, so we're still working to a LARP as everybody, everybody does, so as, you know, as, as low as reasonably possible. Um, and yeah, I'd be perfectly happy taking my family on the train um, if it's done, been done right. Thanks, Ryan. I think that, that covers it. It is interesting that the sort of um, having to make the safety case for hydrogen when, you know, you consider that diesel and, and petrol are also flammable, not not quite in the same way, but but there's still risk involved. Um, so it's interesting that yeah, there's, that's there's, the kind of topics that, that does, does recur. Yeah, and there's an interesting, there's a petrol station in London, which is it's underneath a block of flats um, on a busy road. So if you were to do the safety case for that, so I've got a fuel that produces vapors that are highly flammable, heavier than air, um, and create fireballs. Would, how would you do a safety case to put that beneath a block of flats? 
that just makes no sense yeah. none whatsoever and they're going to bring vehicles with uncontrolled drivers driving into it who could potentially crash into it you wouldn't do it and the reason that we've been able to do it is because the risk has become very well understood and to be honest there's complacency where I, th I think they shouldn't be so in in rail i think you don't have that complacency anyway and we're totally obsessed with quality and safety so I, it's yeah un really understanding getting under the, the skin of that kind of culture of safety i think is really important and philosophically fascinating okay there's there's quite a few questions come in so um let's let's move on okay. to some there's um, an interesting one here from james brown who's asking um what's the sort of embodied carbon in in a hydrogen conversion and you know how long do you think you'd have to operate post conversion um to have lower emissions than just just leaving them as diesel you know what's the carbon payback is is putting in hydrogen technology and retrofitting um you know carbon intensive yeah um so the the the, the very simple answer is i don't have a hard answer for you um so we've not done the, the life cycle analysis at, at that level um the my expectation based on yeah some studies that i've looked at, i've not looked at this in great deal for, for quite a long time um is that it's it's going to be quite reasonable it's going to be a couple of years payback it depends a lot on obviously the recycling and the, the whole picture but the, the framework within which you do your life cycle analysis um so i think it's a really important question i think it's one that people need to do more work on but it's not one that i think that i'm afraid of the answer yeah, I think the answer that's going to come out is going to be one that's going to say, yeah, you need to do this. But by the way, here's your key impact. Go fix them. I think that probably ties in um, to, to this question as well, which is one that, that I, I had as well. This is from Marie Kipling saying that, you know, most of the hydrogen today is produced from, from coal or natural gas or, you know, you get it from cracking hydrocarbons. So what steps have been taken to make sure that Scottish trains are fueled by green hydrogen? And, and is that something you're looking at on that supply side? Yeah. Um, so there's. So, yeah, you could talk for hours on just on that subject alone. So the so, yes, this train will be supplied by green hydrogen because we're going to build a hydrogen refueling station at Bowness and we're going to supply it with green electricity. Um, so that's so from if, from our perspective, wherever we can, we will do that. Um, now, in various other things that we do, we are using fossil hydrogen. Um, and the reason that I'm comfortable, I don't like it, but I, I do it. Um, is that if we try to make everything perfect straight away, we won't get there. So there's something about just getting stuff to happen. Um, so there's two components to this. So one is greening hydrogen production, and the other is making it possible to have hydrogen fuels our vehicles as a way of de you know, replacing diesel and allowing electrification in areas where batteries won't do it or, or wires can't be run. Um, so tackle the two separately. The other bit that brings them together and is in some sense you know, if you're not actually at the nuts and bolts engineering the kind of energy system engineering that the geopolitics if you want to go that wide engineering is and a big thing for scotland is where you've got good renewables resource uh, but it's intermittent if you do the hydrogen fuel cell piece right you can use that to balance and support your intermittency so you can get a greater penetration of renewables um, enabled by hydrogen and fuel cells um, and what's really nice about that is that they go together so you don't accidentally build a really good successful hydrogen economy that happens to be based on dirty fuel um, you develop that hydrogen economy in parallel with an energy system decarbonization plan that also happens to involve hydrogen so as hydrogen's got really popular and everybody's talking about it again there's a lot of hot air in the news at the moment you know, overhyping hydrogen and then totally trashing it. And as always, you know, the truth is somewhere in between. Um, so keep asking that question. Um, but I, I would say don't necessarily beat people too hard with a stick if they've got a transition plan that does involve using some dirty hydrogen initially. Yeah, I think um, I, my, my impression was that it was almost coming out as a waste product as well. But um from from doing some something like cracking hydrocarbon you know you're, you're having those resources for something else and as a, as a byproduct but that obviously depends on demand as well so if everybody wants hydrogen then that will be profitable and it will start being produced um just what you're talking about there on um 
building a, a fueling station ties into to this question from um, Rabbi Jibrin on saying that can rail produce its own hydrogen fuel affordably or does it need to share production capacity with other industries? And I really like what you were just talking about there about looking at the whole energy system. Is that something that, you know, that refueling station would be putting out, you know, hydrogen capacity for things other than hydrogen trains and, and contributing to, you know, that, that whole energy um, yeah. transformation? So I think the, the interesting thing about rail is that rail, if you put the, if you put your filling station and you get your your diagrams your route diagrams right um you could build a filling station that only served rail and it, you'd have sufficient sufficient demand to to make a decent business case for a hydrogen filling station that's only for rail um if you have the opportunity and obviously rail stations tend to be transport hubs for obvious reasons um, if you have the opportunity to share that filling station then with a bus fleet, for example, or a truck logistics fleet, then your business case will get stronger because uh, in general, hydrogen gets cheaper the more of it you use, um, which isn't true. This is the interesting bit with, with electric. So if you're doing electrical installation, if you use existing grid capacity, the electricity is cheap. If you start having to dig up half a city to get a bigger cable in, the electricity gets really expensive. And so these are one. These are some of the things that are going to. These are the interesting trade-offs people are going to be making about how they choose which fuel approach they use in each area. Um, so, so yeah, the, the simple answer is how rail will give sufficient demand to actually build its own infrastructure. Rail could probably do better and build bigger, more cost-effective, more efficient infrastructure by sharing with other modes of transport. Um, and something I think is quite interesting within the nature of rail, because rail is kind of big infrastructure. The, the way that financing is set up for rail infrastructure, both rolling stock and, and obviously the, the, the rails and so on, um, is a better, more obvious fit for doing hydrogen fueling infrastructure. I don't know if I've articulated myself very well there. So putting together a rail fleet is really expensive. You know, you into lots of millions. Um, putting together a fleet of vans and trucks, you might only be one or two million. Um, so suddenly building a filling station of a big scale is 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 confusing and out of the out of the scale. Excuse me, just one second. Thanks so much. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah. So the, the the people that are putting the finance together putting big infrastructure programs together in rail are really well suited to kind of understand and kind of throw their arms around uh, the kind of fueling energy infrastructure piece. Yeah, that's, um, that sounds really interesting and sort of a, a case by case basis, depending on on where you're you're putting it in and what, what the other demand is, is from that transport hub is, is really interesting. And um, we've still got uh, quite a few questions to get through, so uh, we'll try our best in 15 minutes. Uh, there's a question here from from Tom um, Ailey about where do you think this this technology will be used and and the questions he's got specifically do you think he'd use it for high speed in city trains and be for, for freight trains? Um, so I I you know I I expect that at high speed you'd you'd probably want to electrify you know whether you can get the power but freight's an interesting one because um because of that last mile issue of if you've got an electrified uh, track and a freight train can can use it what does it do if, if you're not going to electrify the depot so is there there's something on the freight piece about you know hydrogen hybrids or or that kind of thing yeah so there's a yeah, so, so, yeah i mean this is very very much like you know the, the rail rail industry is very much going right well you know how do we make ourselves fit for the future um and it does get really interesting when you look at, and I sort of think of it as the, the you know, let's say the slower regional rail, the high speed and freight, and it very often gets forgotten about because it's it's kind of separately operated. Um, so if you bring all those pieces together, yes, if you want to go really fast and you've got a lot of people, so a lot of trains, then the business case for electrification is probably really good. So electrify the route, it's your most straightforward, exactly, exactly as you say. Um, your last mile for freight is really interesting so if you've electrified you've got electric running gear on the train anyway 
Um, freight trains obviously are heavy, so doing freight on battery is probably going to be quite tricky because um, you need an awful lot of batteries. Um, there's also quite a lot of interest in using rail freight to move hydrogen around. So as the hydrogen economy develops, you need to move large, larger quantities of hydrogen about. So suddenly you're like, well, rail's really good at moving stuff around. It's also really good at moving around really dangerous stuff, you know, moving nuclear, for example. Um, so that, that idea of just going, people have a fear of moving hydrogen. Actually, if you do it right, of course, it's perfectly safe. But actually, rail's a great place to do it. You put all of that together, and I think there will be quite a strong case for doing hydrogen freight. So some freight locomotive work being done in Canada at the moment. Um, I think the high speed is probably less likely. Um, you, it would be possible, but I think the economics will drive it towards electrification. And again, it's that piece of which technology gets chosen. It isn't an engineer's decision. You know, it's a much wider piece. Um, yeah, I'll pause there. I think I think that covers it. Um, there, there are a couple more specific questions here. Um, another one from James Brown saying, how have you calculated the hydrogen per kilometer requirement um, for the class 158 and 170s? Was that a per vehicle figure? Um, and you know, why do you think the increase in hydrogen for the extra vehicle is so much smaller than for the diesel vehicles? Yeah, it's a good, good question and interesting. So the, the, what they've come from, it's come from taking uh, looking at specific routes, so taking the, you know, the, the actual route, route dynamics and then taking parameters from various kind of rolling stock databases um, to understand yeah, the, the energy consumption. So it's, yeah, it's based on a real route and it's based on the best data we can get hold of. Um, exactly why it's lower, um, I'll confess that I've not dug into this yet. This is quite new work. Um, there's obviously there's a frontal area um obviously you know three carriages or two carriages we've only got one frontal area um but it yeah understanding that and doing a study across lots of different rolling stock and looking at is something i want to do basically more work on so probably this yeah the answer is probably watch this space um, and we'll get some more information out soon just just following on from that um i had a quick quick question about that that calculation and and you know obviously if you're looking at particular duty cycles and saying you're you're sort of optimizing your drive chain to work with that duty cycle is there scope then to look at multiple duty cycles for example if this train you're expecting it to move across somewhere else in it, its um life cycle you know maybe it'll go and operate on a different route maybe it has to do other moves in and around depots or that kind of thing um is, is there you know a risk of optimizing it too much for one thing so that it can't then be used somewhere else or is there a way that you can you can modify it um so there's good question so the in your it depends on how far you go with your optimization how specific you get so yes obviously you, you can optimize it to the, you know, the point it runs out of fuel 10 minutes after it's finished its, its diagram and therefore you can't use it anywhere else so if, yeah, if you if you take it to the scenic stream, then they definitely um, the, the the issue you, you raise there is real. Um, what we tend to find exactly the way that rolling stock is at the moment, you you end up doing a lot of analysis. You understand the general requirements for a particular line, um, and understand that then in fact what you'll find is there'll be a lot of similar lines. So what I'd I'd like to see is that we end up with approaches that will fit multiple routes within a kind of class or within a a, a, a set of a set of use cases um you probably you have the choice to to do a more specification specialization if you want to so again it comes back to this you know non-engineers decision so the rolling stock company is making an informed decision on how much do we want to specialize if we highly optimize it here we, we've got a 10-year contract to run at this line do you know what? it's worth it because in 10 years we're going to do a, a major overhaul anyway and we can reconfigure um so I, yeah, again, maybe that's the answer to that. It's it's broader than engineering. Wait and see. Yeah, thank you. That that answers it. It's it's um yeah, it's an interesting question about what you were talking about systems engineering about thinking about the whole life cycle of of how do you create something that's that's going to last for 20, 30 years or or whatever it is yeah. like in the current stuff. Uh, one of the the benefits we have with electrification is the modularity. Yeah, so there there would be you. You build a diesel loco, it's built to a certain size. I mean, diesel locos get repowered, but typically you don't change the size. 
I think within electrification, it is easier to up, up and down the scale of, of various components. I've got um, another specific question here. This is from Mark Burrell um, saying, will EC79 approval be required for pressure equipment such as regulators um, for use on this project? So EC79 is the, the automotive standard. Um, so you, you, in terms of that carrying standards across, so pulling stuff from automotive, so the, the, the supply chain, the component supply chain we've got available at the moment, most of it is EC79. In fact, there's a new standard coming in to, to re replace EC79. Um, so most of what we're pulling across is, is on the hydrogen system, you're pulling across EC79 compliance. So in the conversation we've been having with RSSB, the Rail Safety Standards Board, is EC79 is, is the baseline that you go to. Um, and yeah, were the different specific standards evolve in rail um, is to be seen. I would imagine, I would hope not, um, because the volume in rail is low versus other industries. So if we can make hundreds of thousands of trucks, let's try and use the same components on trains where we don't make hundreds of thousands. That's very much similar to, to diesel. Yeah, you know, a lot of the diesel engines used in rail, they're you know, mining engines uh, that got adapted to suit rail because rail market is really quite small in the engine market. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, if you like a note of caution to the rail industry, you know, try not to standardize yourself out of affordable equipment. Um, because when we're talking to our supply chain, they'll say, we've got this automotive approved module here. You can have it tomorrow at really quite a decent cost. Oh, you want the rail module? Well, we only make a couple of them every year and it costs a fortune. So again, this, this development of the standards is actually part of the Scottish Train project is working with RSSB and the various rail bodies to establish a set of standards, which obviously are safe, but also try not to just kill the industry by setting unnecessary, unhelpful, you know, even unfair barriers to entry to bring in low cost supply chain. Yeah, so you, you see it as being standards to to use what's already there and to use things that have been developed in other industries in rail yeah, where it's yeah. Yeah, we, we did a piece of work within compliance, you know, down in the technicalities of compliance. Could we establish um what's the word? Um not compatibility, equivalence between various rail standards and rail automotive standards. So you have one of our compliance guys is he's he's ex Bombardier. And then he's also ex Jaguar Land Rover. Now, great, perfect guy. Go and have a look at these sets of standards and see if you can do equivalence. And the, the short answer, and this is you know a quick study, is equivalence is just going to be a nightmare. Trying mm -hmm. to just prove equivalence between the whole set of standards we need for a bin lorry versus a train, that's not going to work. Um, we are going to have to do some work specifically, you know, line by line, uh, point by point analysis of the rail standards. Um, so if you could get really simple equivalence you know this automotive regulation matches that rail regulation that would be a dream but i don't think it's ever going to happen but making it so that it is practical without a whole load of really expensive unit tests that your manufacturers need to do to get rail equivalence is a piece we need yeah you can see there's many hours of discussion in there it's an interesting good question um and i think we'll probably be feeding back some of the learning from that from this project yeah, it sounds, it sounds really interesting. Um, a couple more questions uh, on here. This is from Estelle Yeo saying, um, hi Ben, what are the contingency arrangements for the A-Drive system? For the majority of those routes highlighted in Scotland's you know, decarbonisation strategy, they're single line. So I know that some of the battery trains also carry a diesel engine for backup. Um, is, there, is there a backup or a contingency? Um, for your so let's think. So the when you're doing the early trials, you do your contingency on a kind of trial by trial basis. So your contingency might be, and we I don't we won't do it. Um, but your contingency could be, as you say, carry carry a diesel genset. Your contingency can be obviously to have a diesel loco lurking in the in the background somewhere to, to put, get you out of trouble. Um, what we've taken on on the 314 project is that we've got um, essentially two completely discrete systems. So the front car's got fuel cell hydrogen system under it. The back car has got a hydrogen fuel cell system under it. And under the middle car is are effectively two battery systems, one that talks to one fuel cell and one that talks to the other. Um, and clearly they're linked. And when everything's happy, they operate together. Uh, but we have the option to only run off one system or the other. So we've got two independent systems. They're both based on the same technology. 
Um, so they could both pack up, um, but they are, they are at least two separate systems. And there were some you know, discussions around the, the, the compressor, so your general you know, break and doors compressor and your 110 volt sort of legacy systems. You know, is they, are they charged off one or other of those battery wraps? So I'd say modularity is probably our first friend, um, but actually what I'd really like to get to is not working to that modularity, so just do it right. Um, do sufficient testing that you have a high degree of confidence um, because designing in redundancy and contingency for every scenario, you just keep increasing complexity and cost and you push yourself out. So preferences, do it right, set up your test regime properly, don't break down. Uh, obviously, you need to plan for breaking down. Yeah, so sort of to what extent do you do you plan and, and what you were saying about, you know, keeping risk as, as low as reasonably possible. Do you plan for the one in a million or, you know, or do you not? Do you assume that there's something else that can be done, like you say, that that diesel like are lacking in the background or whatever it happens to be? Um, there's a, another question coming um, on sort of supply side. So this is from um, Phil Calvary saying there's, there's loads of competition for hydrogen. Um, so how can we secure enough for rail if they're competing against other industries? Do, do you think that supply is going to be a problem? Uh, no. So no, the, the, the how do you say it? There's the, there may be supply. There may be competition for hydrogen right now because the infrastructure is not built to support the things people are trying to do. And we've all got this chicken and egg thing we're trying to work our way through. Um, but no, ultimately, there is no shortage of hydrogen. You know, the world is full of hydrogen. Loads of it's used every day in industry and refining and this, that and the other. Um, the question is not, can you get enough hydrogen? The question is, can you get hydrogen where you want it in the in the, the kind of condition that you want it, at the price that you want it, with the environmental footprint that you want it? Um, so I would generally say that if we're looking at new rail infrastructure, rail, rail hydrogen rail projects, we should be looking at it as a whole. Um, and an opportunity to bring forward more green hydrogen rather than go squab squabble over what already exists. I play um, devil's advocate a bit here that that, that came in and, and made me think of this. So one of the questions I was going to ask was about battery supply, and I suppose that that's maybe a bigger worry about how do you ensure enough supply of, of you know the raw materials, batteries, and also that they're made from a lot of you know finite resources essentially. So. Is there a piece that, that needs to be considered on, you know, battery recycling and, and, and that aspect of the lives? Yeah, I'm a, so there's, so on a fuel cell vehicle, we use about a tenth as much battery as you'd use on a battery vehicle. So that's, that's a useful thing. So we've got less energy conversion. Um, the type of batteries we use, we use a titanate. So it's, it's the, and we would expect a titanate battery to last kind of 14 years. So we're not looking at the chucking loads of cheap cells and then just throw them away every now and again. We're going, let's use the really expensive cells and make them last forever. Um, so that's the, the first bit on the battery piece. On the fuel cell piece, the nature of fuel cells, you've, uh, the, the type of fuel cell we use, it's graphite plates, and you can effectively strip them and re, 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 you can service them and put them back into use. So you take the floppy membrane out of the middle and you put the rest of it back into use. Now that floppy membrane has got platinum, and very high value components in it. So there's a motivation to recycle. Now there isn't yet recycling because the market's not big enough, but I think there's a, there's a fairly good case for that. The carbon fiber tanks, what's well, carbon fiber? It, it's a pain to recycle. Um, that needs to be figured out. I saw some stuff in the news just this week, I think around recycling wind turbine blades. Again, as we move to more and more of this, people will figure out how to do it. So it's, it's really important, it needs to be done. Um, I'm not again. I'd say I'm not overly worried about it. And if, if my model was just chuck a gazillion batteries into it, I'd be feeling quite uncomfortable. Again, we will figure out some way of recycling batteries at some point, but it's fundamentally quite difficult because you've got high energy and electrochemistry complexity. Batteries are basically pretty difficult to recycle. It, it, it's a challenge. I'm, I'm glad I'm not battling with. Um, yeah, it needs it needs to be figured out. Definitely. Um, it's just gone seven o'clock, so if, if you're happy, we can finish there. I think we did manage just about to get through through all of the questions, um, which is fantastic. So there's there's loads uh, loads coming through. Um, 
I just want to say um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for answering all the questions. Um, I hope that everybody watching um, enjoyed it. I thought it was fascinating. Um, and it's, it's really good to, to see what's happening um, in Scotland. We, we did have a talk about the, you know, the decarbonisation action plan. So it's really, really great to be able to see part of, of how that, that might be achieved and, and to have this, this project coming through. I think one thing that you didn't cover in your presentation is when we're expecting the, the train to, you know, to be tested, to be on the line. Uh, do you have a date for it? Uh, well, we got there's a very simple date, which is COP26. Um, so that's uh, yeah, beginning of November. Um, so that's the hard date that we're working to. Um, so we're yeah, in fact, we're we're we're, we're actually the, if you like the midpoint of the project, um, and we're going right. How far? How how have we done so far? Where have we got to? What do we need to do to make sure that we actually hit that hit that deadline? So it's a deadline. We're aiming for it. It's a completely mad deadline, and it always was. So if we don't meet it, don't kill us. Uh, but that, that's the objective. So I, I very much hope and expect that there will be a train trundling around Bonas um, by November. Brilliant, that's fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Thanks again um, for your talk. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Grand, nice one guys, take care. Bye.